Hi, my name is Alfred, and welcome back to the Bone Charm Wiki, featuring Bone Charms. I'm going to continue reading the Dishonored Wiki, because I had a really nice time last time when I did it. Supernatural Abilities Supernatural abilities are manifestations of the void that can be divided into two categories, active and passive. When bestowed by the outsider, mana is needed to perform active abilities, and the amount required varies by power. When granted by powerful artifacts linked to the void, they only need to cool down, as seen, as, as seen in Dishonored Death of the Outsider. Mana can be restored using pure spiritual remedy or Atomire solution. A small percentage of the mana, 20%, will recharge automatically following a short delay after using the power. Several bone charms can affect the amount of mana stored, increase the amount gained, and provide other sources of mana. The upgrading of supernatural abilities is done through the collecting and use of runes. Only those with the outsider's mark can use runes. Blink. Rapidly move forward and a shorter distance upward. 20%. Blink 3. Increase movement distance in all directions. 20%. Dark vision. See living slash dead slash unconscious person slash animals, their side cones and corvo sounds. Twenty percent. Dark vision two. Also see resources green, and machinery traps in blue. Devouring swarm. Forty percent. Summon rats that attack each other. Attack others and eat corpses. Devouring swarm two. Rats attack and eat faster. Possession. Possess fists, people, <clears throat> excuse me, possession one, 60%. Possess rats, fish, and hounds. Possession two, also possess people, can't make them attack or use powers. Bend time one, slow time for about 12 seconds. Every attack is an instant kill. Bend time two, freeze time, can pluck fired projectiles out of midair. A slightly shorter duration than Tier 1, about eight, 8 seconds. Wind Blast. Blast back groups of foes non-lethal. Break doors. Blast bolts back at foes. Wind Blast. 2. Kill foes if blown against solid objects. Vitality. More health. Vitality 2. Health regenerates quicker. Bloodthirsty. Melee... Kill animations become brutal. Bloodthirsty 2. Kill multiple foes in melee. Adrenaline builds up quicker. Agility 1. Higher jumps and less damage from falls. Agility 2. Faster climbing, running, and swimming. Shadow kill 1. Unaware foes turn to ash when killed. Shadow kill 2. All foes turn to ash when killed. Void Gaze. Dowd can see the location of runes and bone charms within a certain radius. The outsider's mark on Dowd's hand will glow if aiming to a rune or bone charm. Void Gaze 2. Also see living beings, their sound, their coins of sight in yellow, resources in green, and machineries in blue. Also Dowd's sound. Summon Assassin. Summon a novice assassin to fight by Dowd's side. Summon Assassin 2. Summon a Master Assassin to fight by Dowd's side. Pull. Pull can be used to lift inanimate objects, collect and pilfer items. Pull 2. Pull can lift bodies. Living enemies are bound and can be choked out or executed. Arcane Bond. Summoned Assassins can teleport and get an increase in health. Arcane Bond 2. Assassins can use pull, are immune to bend time, and gain shadow kill. Corvo. Bend time. Upgrades to stop time. Upgrades to relativity, which then upgrades to lasting bend time. Blink upgrades to greater blink, which then becomes redirective blink and blink assault. Dark vision becomes greater dark vision and premonition. Devouring Swarm becomes Greater Swarm, Rat Piper, and Twin Storms. Twin Swarms. Possession becomes Chain Hosts, Corpse Possession, Human Possession, 
and lasting possession. Wind blast, greater wind blast, and shock wave. Emily has domino. Link human targets so they all die or fall unconscious together. Link three, and then link four are the upgrades. Doppelganger. Summon a shade of yourself that attacks enemies, attracts enemies. Baffling shade. Your doppelganger will confuse enemies as it fades away. Deadly shade. Summon a doppelganger that can fight enemies and assassinate when undetected. Twin shades. Summon two doppelgangers who act independently of each other. Transposition. Swap places with your summoned doppelganger. Far reach. Pull yourself rapidly across the distance. Pull objects, pull enemies, and decelerate are all upgrades of that. Mesmerize. Summon a void spirit to infall humans or hounds. Mesmerize 3, Mesmerize 4, and Lasting Mesmerize are all upgrades. Shadow Walk. Assume a stealthier form for a short time. Rat Shadows. Move through rat tunnels in your stealthier form. Improved Shadow Attack. Assassinate or incapacitate up to two enemies during Shadow Walk. Greater Shadow Attack becomes three enemies. And Shadow Run. Move faster while in your shadow form. Agility. Increase your jump height and distance. Rapid Sprint. Sprint faster. Catfall. Take less falling damage. And then there are the Bone Charm Crafting. Reflexes. Block projectiles. Focus slide. Slow time while sliding if an aimed or if aiming a ranged weapon at an enemy. Superior deflection. Deflect projectiles towards the nearest enemy. Adept parry. Window of time for parrying is increased. Snap reaction. Quick reflexes slow time briefly when an enemy spots you. Bloodfly swarm. Transform enemies killed in combat into blood flies as they die. Strength. Throw objects farther. Greater strength. Break down weak wooden doors with your sword. Vitality. Increase health and resilience. Greater vitality. Health is improved. Displace. Relocate by swapping positions. Foresight. Stop time and explore in spirit form. Semblance. Impersonate another human. Void Strike. A charge strike that'll knock back enemies and assassinate unaware targets. Rat Whispers. Hear the voice of rats. Other users and their powers. Granny Rags. Blink. Unnamed variant of Blink that used during combat that creates a shockwave to stun, damage, and knock back her enemies. Devouring Swarm. Unnamed ability that allows her to control rats summoned by others. Apprentice. Fog collar and rune crafting. Sorry, I was just reading what fog collar is. The lonely rat boy obtained devouring swarm. Maura Sullivan obtained pull. A witch got possession. An unknown woman got possession and an unnamed ability that can pick locks. The Lila Copperspoon got blink. Bloodbriar. A wind blast like scream. Arcane Bond, Thorns, Doppelganger, Rune Crafting, an unnamed ability that allows her to create enchanted statues of herself and communicate through them, an unnamed ability that can create Gravehounds, an ability that can transform things to stone, an ability that can take away the mark of an outsider from another mark bearer, and an ability that can turn paintings into reality. The Brigmore Witches have Blink, Thorns, The Scream, paint, Painted Flesh, Bloodbriar, an unnamed ability that destroyed an entire room at Coleridge Prison. An unnamed ability that uses the Oraculum's lenses and a person as a sacrifice to trap in his own mind. The Whalers have Blink, Pull, Vitality, and Shadow Kill. Zukov has Corroded, Bone Charm Crafting. And then there's a whole bunch of Bone Charms. According to Harvey Smith of Arcane Studios, the muttered phrases when Corvo uses the power are gibberish phrases made up of words in French, English, Arabic, Chinese, and Portuguese. Using the quick access wheel will slow time to 120th its original speed. 
Having the radial open is not ability-based, as movement speed is also reduced to a 20th. With the New Game Plus mode for Dishonored 2, it's possible to use Emily's powers when playing as Corvo, and vice versa. Before this, it was possible through hacking. In Dishonored 2, A Crack in the Slab, the protagonist's active supernatural abilities are disabled, though the passive ones still work, as it was decided that removing them would be would be too disempowering. Originally, Blink and Far Reach were going to be left active, but this decision would change when the developers decided that time travel was interesting enough. In Dishonored 2, supernatural abilities used in the Void consume no mana. Originally, Emily had the ability to walk on walls and ceilings, changing gravity for herself and objects she touched. This was cut very early due to the technical difficulties associated with it, eventually becoming Shadow Walk. With the original game plus mode for Dishonored Death of the Outsider, you will be able to play with three of Corvo and Emily's abilities, which will replace three of your own. And then there are some concept arts. Next, I will read what a whaler is, if it so pleases you. The whalers are a gang of supernatural assassins in Dishonored, operating in Dunwall and led by Dowd. Dowd founded the Whalers sometime after his arrival in Dunwall in 1811. He recruited mercenaries, street kids, and refugees, trained them in the art of stealth and assassination, and shared with them some of his powers gifted by the outsider. They were united in a desire to cleanse the cities of its undesirables and turn a profit in the process. Their targets included criminals, city officials, and even aristocrats. In 1829... Dowd met Billy Lurk, who after years of training would become his greatest protege. The group's name came from the industrial gas masks they wear to conceal their identity, which are used in the whale oil processing plants. They are separated in three different ranks, novice assassins wearing gray outfits, master assassins wearing dark blue ones, and unique leader assassins such as Dowd and Lurk wearing dark red suits. All weapons, all the members make use of the same weapons and masks. During the Rat Plague, the whalers established their base of operations in the Chamber of Commerce, on the Rudd Shore Financial District, left abandoned after the flood devastated the area in 1836. The place offered a strategic and discreet position, even though the whalers had to chase the surviving, the survivors living in its ruins off. After Dow leaves Dunwall, the whalers splinter, creating some new fraction, factions, others turning against each other, and some simply retiring. Domus stepped up and attempted to keep the group together, recruiting some new members from the smaller street gangs. But eventually, he too disappeared, and the remnants of the gang disbanded. In 1851, Zukov and Galia Fleet, a former whaler, reformed the gang of assassins for a short time, using a whale slaughterhouse and slaughterhouse row as their new base of operations. Assassins possess supernatural abilities, including blink, which they refer to as transversals, and pull, known to them as tethering, which pulls an object towards or target towards the caster. The Assassin's Transversals have much greater range than Corvo's Blink ability, but whether the state is based on function or practice is unknown. Traversals also seem to work differently, requiring the user to think of its location rather than seeing it, as revealed in a vacation d- conversation during the flooded district. I shouldn't really have a job reading things when I have dyslexia, but that's the world I live in. It is also stated that looking at and focusing on the destination while performing a transversal limits the potential of the power. Assassins often use transversals in combat, blinking next to targets and attacking them directly. Tethering is used to snare and pin objects, and it's not limited by physics. Tethered targets can be lifted and held in the air, as performed on Corvo during the attack on Empress Jessamine Caldwin, though a target is still able to move while tethered. Moving against its pole is met with great resistance. Assassins gain their powers through Dowd's arcane bond. This means they also have access to shadow, kill, shadow kill, vitality, and the ability to move through Dowd's bend time if he chooses to let them. In the addition of their swords, assassins use wrist bows to perform ranged attacks. Much like City Watch officers, assassins will often dodge Corvo's sword attacks, even after being countered. They will frankly try to knock Corvo back in order to make better use of their wrist bows, but Blink can be used to minimize this. Be careful not to get ambushed while passing assassin territory. Dark vision is a helpful ability to locate any possible assassins lurking in the area. Getting to high ground significantly decrease, decreases Corvo's chance of being ambushed. Assassins will often teleport behind Corvo, 
or pull them into bad positions through their supernatural abilities. Bend time is a good way to turn the odds in Corvus' favor. It's inadvisable to directly confront groups of assassins as the powers make their attacks hard to protect or even block. Even on a high chaos approach, it's advised to single them out before attacking. When attacking assassins with ranged weaponries, it is advised to catch them off guard, otherwise they will teleport or dodge, thus making Corvo waste ammunition. Assassins are much harder to shake off the normal guards due to their teleportation. When playing a low chaos approach, often sleep darts the only way to knock them out once alerted. If assassin is hit with wound blast or stinky, sticky grenade, it will blink, nullifying the damage. Their mana must recharge afterward, so if Corvo attacks again before their mana recharges, they will not be able to blink in time. Unlike overseers, their masks don't grant them any protection. Thus, assassins can be killed by a crossbow bolt to the head. If tethered, whether by doubt or an assassin, Corvo can blink away to escape the effects or of the ability. Alternatively, he may charge the caster, turning their ability against him. They're immune to certain poisons. This is not applicable to the sleep darts utilized by Corvo. Although whalers wear gas masks, they're not immune to the bottles of river crust acid thrown by the dead eels. The degree to which the da, uh, da, 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 the degree to which the assassin share endowed's powers is beyond his control, with some of them failing to receive any powers at all. If an assassin leaves the whalers, their powers will fade over time. Assassins do not talk or shout during combat. Uh oh, I'm oops. Shout during combat, even while on fire, but do upon spotting Corvo or while patrolling. The overseer music box prevents assassins from performing transversals and tethering much in the same way it inhibits Corvo and Dodd's magic use. The assassin in-game model recycles an old design that was originally intended for Corvo. Again, I think that that's probably because there was a bunch of different plans for this game. The heart is greater difficulty learning the secrets of individual assassins. It mentions it is though as there is a cloak around him and I cannot see through it, and that they have secrets so well kept even I cannot discern the truth. According to Harvey Smith, the Whalers believe Dowd is absolutely unstoppable, and their powers, extensions of his, make them arrogant. Meaning that some of them are not as afraid of Corvo as they should be. The Whalers are equipped with a poison needle in their gloves, used to end their lives. Oops. Used to end their lives if they're captured and interrogated. The filters in the whaler's mask give the air a rubbery, chalky smell, and the masks are rather hot. Then there's a bunch of art. They do have a really cool gas mask, although you can very much tell that they're just combine uh, civil protection. But that's all right. <laughs> Cracking my neck there, sorry. All right. Enemies and Dishonored. Watch lower guards and the most basic soldiers of the city watch, and as such the weakest. They are new recruits and only issued a standard sword and uniform, not even a helmet. Most members of the low guard are recruited from prison. They have no range attack, but they will pick up debris, rocks, bricks, etc., and throw it at Corvo. They are more cowardly than city watch or city guards. If one of them dies in front of the others, they will flee to safety to sound an alarm. Despite their weaknesses, they are brutal compared to order, particularly to ordinary c citizens, and are known to be ill-mannered and unkempt. They are almost always accompanied by an officer or member of the guard. Trivia. A watchman's hat may fly off when he's struck. Earl Simmons, Morris, Hamrick, and Hatwork are several loyal ro lower guards addressed by name. Some of the lower guards can be seen with burn scars on the left side of their face. It's hinted in Sokolov Technology in the New Age that lower guards can be ordered to replace whale oil tanks and security system, although those, due to the volatile nail of the combustion, can sometimes explode and cause harm. Despite this, only regular guards can be seen replacing tanks during a scripted scene. And then, of course, there's a bunch of screenshots and concept art. City Watch Guards. Sadistic law enforcers separated, only, separated from criminals only by a uniform. That's a really, really good description, actually. I really rather quite like that. That's very evocative. 
Uh, I'm losing my voice. Can you tell? I'm a little sick. Forgive me. City Watch Guard, so the officers of the City Watch who patrolled the city of, his gun, of, of Dunwall. They're all drawn from common citizens. Though unlike the lower guard, it's unlikely they're from prisons. Some of them share statistic viewpoints on the afflicted citizens, such as share similar statistic viewpoints on the afflicted citizens as the Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs, and are eager to cleanse Dunwall of them. The heart says that some of the only things separated them from common criminals are their uniforms and some skill with their swords. Guardsmen can be overheard attempting to barter for one another's elixir rations, elixir rations, and been known to purchase bootleg elixir from Slackjaw and his Bottle Street gang for fear of contacting the plague. Watchmen react to alert broadcast over loudspeakers to the sound of alarms if they're close enough to hear them, and are able to pass through walls of light unharmed, though their understanding of this technology is limited. When whale oil tanks are removed from arc pylons or other devices, they will not replace them. Being the most common enemies in the early events of Dishonored, they're somewhat lacking in technique while in combat. Being neither as agile or tactical as officers, nor utilizing special abilities such as the Bottle Street Gang and Weepers. They can perform crouching attacks, sometimes surpassing Corvo's block, and are able to throw objects when they cannot reach Corvo. However, they have the tendency to hit each other when they're in their fellow guards' line of fire. Notes. Guards will occasionally use streets as latrine and will often head to a slightly secluded place to relieve themselves. Knocking them out or killing them here is a good plan if you're trying to avoid detection. Guards often accompany a single officer in small patrols. Up to four can be seen following an officer at a time. They're also seen making arrests at key points in the game and cutscenes, while officers merely oversee the affair. Guards who patrol on intersecting paths may notice that their fellow guard is missing, and investigate the disappearance. It does not really raise their alert status. There are no normal guards in the Boyle Mansion or around it, only officers. There's no normal guards in the Knife of Dunwall or the Brigmore, which is DLC. The guard includes the ranks of Corporal and Sergeant, which begin after the officer ranks. And then there's some more art. City Watch officers, more polished and professional than the average city guard, but just as brutal. Oh, Lord. Perhaps I should have waited to record. Honestly, though, I was really excited to read this. <clears throat> Forgive me. City Watch officers the elite, or the elite guard are police and protectors of the Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs, as well as other important aristocrats. They act as leaders to the rest of the City Watch, as well as functioning as detective inspectors. They are loyal, disciplined, and courageous, never fleeing from battle except to raise the alarm primarily come from noble or wealthy families. Officers are well-trained and competent in swordsmanship and marksmanship. They prefer to fight at a distance, but can easily charge Corvo and Dodd and use their swords. They are capable of fast attacks that can easily hit an unaware opponent. Oops. Even a few officers are able are enough to quickly take down an unprepared enemy. Being shot by an officer not only causes damage, but interrupts attacking and blocking. Officers wear ornate coats over waistcoats, with different colors to distinguish their division. Dark blue and red is the standard uniform. Sky blue denotes those assigned to protect aristocrats and other important officers. Persons, rather. Red coats mark high-standing officials in the army, such as General Turnbull. And ocean blue marks naval officers, <laughs> such as Admiral Farley Havelock. Though the officer wears no additional body armor, they can take more damage than lightly armored guards. In addition to their coats, some officers wear helmets that protect them from most projectiles. Just scrolling through the uh, quotes here. Officers are equipped with swords and pistols. When using their pistols, officers will take a short pause to aim before they fire. Gorbo can use this brief period of time to attack them and disrupt their action. However, they may dodge Corvo's strikes, and after two dodges, they may kick him away. Officers show an understanding of tactics and battles, often going around in a battle opponent and attacking from behind. Due to the helmets that protect their body from all projectiles, a sleep dart to the or their head from all projectiles, a sleep dart to the body is the quickest and most reliable way of disabling them if hit from a great distance. Shots fired by officers will hit other guards if they're in the way, causing significant damage. Known ranks for officers are lieutenants, captains, majors, and generals. It's unknown whether or not they have colonels. 
Many officers do not have command over a unit of their own, and are simply part of groups made up entirely of officers. The hard reveals that officers are often the son of rich and powerful families. This brings the question of whether, actually, whether they actually obtain their ranks through merit or simply purchase officer commissions through the government in a fashion similar to the historical British Army. According to developer Harvey Smith, there are only a few female notable officers in the City Watch. Like their male counterparts, some of these female watch officers enjoy whiskey and cigars. Officers are much more civil than lower guards, and their conversations are moderately polite, showing their courtesy to their fellows. They rarely converse with lower-ranking men. Despite their neutrality, guards in the Boyle party will, not, will kick Corvo away if they see him stealing, but will not take further action unless attacked. An officer may try to play the piano if one is nearby. That's interesting. Officers' helmets appear to be based off of British police helmets, and spiked helmets from 19th, I think? 19th century Russia, Prussia, known as Pickelhaben. Officers are known to leave their post to urinate while on patrol, including off of King's Barrow Lighthouse, though they do this left often than their low-ranking counterparts. In their mission eminent domain, an officer in a lower guard can be heard discussing how they plan to evict a family in the legal district by going through the back door of the mansion. City so watch officers at the Timsha estate wear gray waistcoats under blue instead of the usual deep blue and red and are marked as estate officers in HUD. City watch officers are one of the only two character classes in Dishonored that use pistols, the other being warfare overseers. In none of the DLCs, one of the members of the Hatter gang will use pistols. Officers can occasionally be seen reading books. Officers can occasionally be seen reading, looking at paintings or other works of art, and sometimes comment on them, often to themselves. And then there's a lot more art. And of course, screenshots. Yeah, I really like these. These guys are so cool. These guys are very, very Half-Life. Tall boys. Tall boys, also called stilt walkers, are an elite part of the City Watch. This, they use a suit that's an amalgamation of the spindle-legged armatures, which keeps them out of the reach of the rats that swarm Dunwall. Accompanying this, the tall boys wear heavy armor plating, which protects them during confrontation. Tall boys are encountered at the beginning of Lady Boyle's last party, with the last one appearing at each subsequent level, including the light at the end. Though their offensive power is significant, their movement capacity is limited. A circle strafe is an effective way to create an opening that will allow a few shots to be undertaken. Each tall boy has a compound bow and has a spotlight attached to a suit, which you can use to peer into shadows. Tall boys react to alerts aired via loudspeaker if they're near enough to hear them and they can pass through walls of light unharmed unless the walls have been rewired. Tall boys have extra shielding in the form of collapsible wooden shields attached to their armor, which protect them from shockwaves. Following this, due to their leg armatures, tall boys are unaffected by the devouring swarm power, and, take, and their heavy armor completely protects them against sleep darts and chokeholds. The only opportunity to take a tall boy down non-lethal is with a special arc pylon during the mission of the Loyalists. Those attempting a clean hands run are advised to avoid them altogether. Officially referred to as stilt walkers, tall boys were invented by Anton Sokolov in 1836 to be part of the city watch. It was not until the lower region's reign in 1837 that they really began to be used, and stories of their terror quickly spread. After Burroughs was deposed and his reign ended, tall boys were removed from the watch and continued to exist in childhood stories as icons of horror. Somehow the Roaring Boys gang managed to obtain one of the suits, surprising members of the Watch who had not been trained against this kind of threat. There are several ways to effectively kill a tall boy. Drop assassinating them allows Corvoton to kill them in a single hit. This can be achieved by ambushing them from a vantage point of sufficient height, or using a combination of agility and blink to reach their level, though the latter is considerably more difficult after having been detected. Killing a tall boy in this fashion will unlock the big boy achievement. When drop assassinating a tall boy, there's a small chance for a large amount of damage to be, called to, to be dealt to Corvo. Explosive bullets or a well-placed sticky grenade can t kill a tall boy in one shot, provided that the three whale oil tanks on the back are, are destroyed. A grenade can be cooked to explode once it hits a tall boy, killing it. Shooting the three whale oil tanks on their back will cause the tanks to explode. All three tanks, however, must be destroyed for the tall boy to fall. If shot with a non-explosive projectile like standard pistol ammunition, the ammunition of the hit tank, the explosion of the hit tank will not compromise the other two, making two more precise hits necessary for a kill. 
Using a large amount of ammunition to shoot tall boys will generally kill them, but it's not the most economical way of eliminating them. Using wind blast to deflect one of their explosive arrows will send it back at the tall boy who fired it. When close to them as possible, using bend time, jump to them using agility or blink, and attach a spring razor to their body. Possess them and walk them into water. However, this can only be done in some parts of the game, where there's water near a tall boy. Under the effects of bend time, shoot a crossbow bullet to the tall boy and attach a spring razor on it. Aim correctly, it'll kill the tall boy when the bolt hits him. Preferably aim for the tall, tall boy's body. Agility jump and use bloodthirsty one to kill them. Shoot an incendiary bolt at, an ang at such an angle to hit the middle of the tall boy, bypassing shields. Rewire soak a lot of technology to kill the tall boy. While Corvo's first encounter with the tall boy is at the beginning of Lady Boyle's last party, they're first seen when Corvo enters the Vord for the first time. According to commentary by art director Sebastian Mitton, the idea for the tall boys came after watching a man on stilts cleaning a building facade. Originally, they were described designed as a type of town crier, which was replaced by loudspeakers, but they slowly evolved into the heavily armed guards that they are now. Given that Dishonored's visual designer is Viktor Antonov, the man who designed Half Life 2's style, this evolution may mean the current form of the tall boy is based off of Half Life 2 striders, which are tall, biomechanical alien tripods that help to keep order, and are generally difficult to take down. According to the book The Exquisite Tall Boy, every tall boy is heavily jogged with something that renders them resistant to pain and dulls whatever empathy they might normally possess. It's not certain whether the tall boy's resulting decrease in empathy is a part of the drug's intended effects or merely a side effect. Though tall boys shoot explosive arrows, when Corvo loots their bodies, he gets an incendiary bolt instead. Despite the heavy armor, a tall boy can be devoured by hagfish and rats like any other corpse. Tall boy is heavy enough to make the earth tremble as it walks by. Tall boy isn't the only enemy not to make any vocal noise at all. In Dishonored, the Wormwood Deceit, Corvo says the tall boys are accompanied by an unmistakable sound of gears and grinding metal. Instead of the normal compound bow, the Roaring Boys equip their tall boy, the big lad, with a flamethrower. In Dishonored 2, a guard in the guard building in the upper Aventa district during the mission the Clockwork Mansion, two guards are having a conversation comparing the new Clockwork soldiers to the old tall boys from the time of the Rat Plague. One of the guards notes that he prefers the tall boys because they made people stand up straight. Canonically, Corvo destroyed a number of tall boys during the events of Dishonored, but broke a few ribs doing so. These things are so cool. They're such a cool design. They're such a good idea. Damn, they're so cool. All right. Dead Counters. Dead Counters are members of the Dunwall City Watch, responsible for dealing with play victims alive and dead. The position was commissioned by Lord Regent Hiron Burroughs and started during the month of rain, 1837. It's open to City Watch officers for increased pay, which, at 10 coins a day, is one and a half normal salary for officers. They also receive an extra elixir to protect them from catching the plague. Officers must take a test when applying, and if they're selected, they receive two weeks paid training. The dead counter has command over any other members of the city watch in any situation when dealing with the plague, but in other matters, they have to report to a commanding officer. There are indications that even though the dead counter salary is high, the position is not popular due to the obligation of dealing with weepers. During the mission Eminent Domain in the Knife of Dunwall, officers can be heard talking to a watch lower guard named Simmons about how much better the job of evicting healthy people is compared to working in weeper dens. Simmons expresses guilt for his actions, but the officer claims he should be thankful for the job he has. Dead counters are often responsible for seizing the property of those afflicted by the plague, due to a new law stating that all possession of plague victims immediately become property of the state. There is ample evidence that the dead counters are corrupt. In a journal, a butcher notes that there are tribes, there are bribes to be paid to barrister on old Tim's dead counters. Even though dead counters are rarely encountered in Dishonored, posters advertising the position can be found throughout Dunwall. Though the book Dead Counter Responsibility says the position is only open to officers, normal guards can also be seen acting as dead counters. This implies the position is open to non-commissioned officers, such as sergeants, which normal guards make up. In the mission High Overseer Campbell, a dead counter can be seen on the bridge at the end of John Clavering Boulevard. 
He's one of three City Watch members that are encountered there. He's wearing a mask and carrying the bodies with a clipboard, as the other two are throwing the bodies off a bridge onto a barge. He does not wear an officer's uniform, but speaks like one. In his journal, Mace Brimsley notes that before he and his wife were taken to flooded district, the dead counter does not check for pulse and only seemed concerned with the value of his estate. It's pretty interesting, actually. All right, what should I read next? Just a moment. Overseers. The Warfare Overseers, or simply Overseers, are a militant faction within the Abbey of the Everyman. So we're in a combat, combat those who associate themselves with the Outsider. During the reign of Hiram Burroughs, Outsiders are feared by the populace for their brutality, and despised the, by the City Watch for their zealotry. The Order is headquartered at the Office of the High Overseer within Dunwall, and headed by an High Overseer. During the events of Dishonored, the position is held by Corvatana's first assassination target, that is Campbell who is replaced by loyalist conspirator Teague Martin. The location of Warfare Overseers and the corresponding mask varies from location to location. In Dishonored and DLCs, Overseers were golden masks stylized in the face of Benham and Holger. Their back supports lay partially over a piece of cloth covering the rear of the Overseer's head, while the front provides protection. The symbol of the trident, a trident passing through a C, capital C, shows prominently on their forehead. Symbol of the Abbey, rather. The same symbols are embroidered onto the sleeves of their dark jacket, which appear to be standard issue. High Overseer Thaddeus Campbell wear the same uniform, but with a grey outsider. In Dishonored 2 and Death of the Outsider, the Carnarchan branch of the Overseers wear grey masks that are emblazoned with the symbol of the Abbey. Unlike the mask of the Overseer in Dunwall, these masks cover a large portion of the head. Carnarchan Overseers also wear vestments that include white gloves and black tabards emblazoned in the Abbey symbol. Vice overseers wear similar uniforms, with crimson towers and black gloves instead. All roving vice overseers wear the uniform of regular members. Dunwall branch overseers are also seen, wearing the golden Holger masks, and similar vestments to the Carnican overseers, though with darker colors. High overseer Yu Kulan's uniform has red tabard and gloves instead. Induction. Overseer candidates are chosen through a system known as the Trial of Aptitude in which veteran overseers carefully observe and study individuals, often children, who show proper inclination to become future overseers. After sufficient observation, promising entrants are taken from their homes and brought to an outpost, where they are further assessed and evaluated. On the last night of the month of rain, they begin a pilgrimage to Whitecliffe, where during an elaborate ceremony, it's determined which of the children will become overseers and which will be put down. The hearts suggest that some candidates with proper in, in, uh, inclination to become overseers are actually the sons of heretics and apostates who were accept, executed by the Abbey. If, a cor if Corvo points the heart at an overseer, it claims the overseer watches his parents were tortured for the worship of the outsider. It's possible some recruits join the order willingly. In one of his announcements, propaganda officer states that parents should send their children to be tested by the overseers, suggesting the practice is perfectly acceptable. Eavesdropping on overseers suggests that reveals that some join the Abbey at a f later age rather than being drafted through abduction. Officer Byrne seems to have joined the Abbey on his own volition. Overseers are highly durable. Thanks to the metallic masks they wear, they are immune to frontal headshots. Though they're shot here, they will be momentarily stunned and their current action disrupted. They can also com command wolfhounds, which can immobilize and inflict serious damage to the protagonist. In combat, Overseers fight with sabers, and occasionally armed with grand pistols. Unlike City Watch, who prefer to dodge, Overseers are more likely to block melee attacks while aiming their pistols. In addition, certain Overseers can use technological advices attached to their abdomens, known colloquially as an Overseer music box. They can negate the power of supernatural abilities granted by the Outsider, and deal a continuous stream of damage and supernatural target. Those things are so cool. Trivia. Originally, overseers were designed as witch hunters. The original appearance was similar to the Puritans of 17th century England. A mask of the overseers resembles those of the Persian immortals in 300, the movie, by Frank Miller. Frank Miller's a piece of shit, though. Let it be known. An outpost, outpost for abducted overseer candidates can be found in Backyard at the office of the High Overseer. 
During the Knife of Dunwall, Campbell sends a team of overseers to the flooded district to combat Dad's assassins. Corvo can refine the remains of the squadron scattered through the district, but during the actual DLC, Dowd can choose to spare or execute them as he sees fit. An overseer outfit is available in the Brigmore Witch's mission, A Stay of Execution for Lizzie, if a disguise for the overseer Dowd favor is purchased. Bungie Rothwild's younger brother was an overseer candidate who allegedly failed the trials of aptitude and was put down. The overseers attempt to take form, take part in a form of divination as they claim they will read signs on Corvo slash Dowd's entrails. The overseers are a reference to the Order of the Hammer, or Hammerites, from the Thief game. Thief games. The Hammerites are religious zealots loyal to the builder and enemies, and enemies to worshippers of the trickster, and they're known for working as a police force before the city watch. In some places where overseers are present, they can be overheard reciting the seven strictures. In the mission The Surge, two overseers can be overheard discussing how consuming rats is a defense against the Abbey. The prohibition of consuming rats and other vermin seems to be part of the religious tradition of the Abbey, though it's mentioned in several occasions throughout the series. The collar of his uniform resembles the collar of a priest's vestment. They're the only character crest that utilizes grenades. A pistol-wielding overseer can inflict friendly fire damage on his, compo- on his comrade should they obstruct his line of fire, which is common in the Dishonored franchise. This can be exploited to weaken the opposition if combat's unavoidable. Because overseers share most of their dialogue, share most of their lines in the watch officers, their exclusive lines may be recited in a different voice used for the shared dialogue. Two officers can be overheard in Lady Boyle's last party, recalling an incident where a woman was supposed to sing for officers of the city watch, but lost her voice right at the beginning. Coincidentally, an overseer patrol passed by blaring a music box where the woman stopped singing. She was tackled by the overseer and detained as a witch. The officer had to go to a go to the Lord Regent and request a letter of pardon to get her released from the Abbey, saying she hasn't been the same since. It's a common misconception that overseers are not allowed to be married. Overseer Jasper is mentioned to have a wife, indicating this may not be the case. Overseer masks from each nation have a different design. Current masks of overseas overseers of Circanos have different designs from those of Crystal. And to Dishonored 2, during the Dust District mission, if Enley Coleman inspects the dentistry mannequin heads during the chaos, she comments on how they resemble the masks used by the overseers in Morley. And then there's a whole bunch of these things. All right, I'm going to read the last one here. The Overseer Music Box is a device used by warfare overseers at the Abbey of the Everyman, which, when activated, prevent the use of any supernatural abilities within range and send in a sound wave bearer to keep Corvo Tano away. Down and his assassins are also susceptible to his effects. As such, the protagonist is required to use ranged and melee weaponry to combat overseers who use them. The melee box can also harm the protagonist by firing wind blast like waves that push him backwards, deal heavy damage, and negate magic powers. Corvo first discovers the device, the device in the workshop located in the Black Yard of the Office of the High Overseer, where it's described in a note written by High Artificer Bartholomew and called Holger's Device. According to the studies of the Abbey of the Everyman, the box produces mathematically pure notes, which act on the theory that there are hidden waves throughout the magical world, or natural world, which is such a cool idea. It's like, what if math core was so pure that it actually acted like bardic music? What if bardic music existed and math core music just was almost like a wizard spell? That's so rad. In an audiograph recorded by the Hari Artificer, the concern is raised over whether or not the mecha- mechanisms and their effects are themselves magic. This issue is not addressed by any other members of the Abbey. Music box are built in secret locations around the Empire of the Isles by certain overseers. The materials and processes used to create the boxes are concealed from all overseers, except those directly involved in the process to prevent heretics from building the devices themselves. The boxes aren't built until they're acquired. Then they can be sent directly to the location that requested one. The process is lengthy, and some overseers can be heard complaining about it, while others defend the procedure as being necessary to prevent heresy. Overseers carrying this music box can be especially deadly. In addition to having their face shielded by masks, those who carry the boss can use it to protect themselves from strikes to the chest. The box's great range, ability to block damage, and the protagonist's hampered ability to flee without his powers make music box overseers priority targets during combat. A good strategy to kill an overseer with a music box is to fire an incendiary bolters as his legs. 
as overseers move slowly when carrying a music box and are easy targets. Grenades, explosive bullets, and sleep darts are also effective. They are vulnerable from the rear, so attacking them from behind is a good tactic. If taking the low chaos approach, be sure to get rid of overseers the music box first. Music box is first. Their music can stop the protagonist mid blink and cast all possession and dark vision. Bend time will also be affected, though stop time will not. Even though it's implied that bone charms will usually emit some warmth and turn cold and useless when in the vicinity of the music, the protagonist's charms will continue to work normally. Two city watch officers can be overheard in the estate district discussing a rumor that a group of overseers declared a woman a witch because she lost her voice as a group of overseers passed by with a music box. Music boxes can also break glass and cause whale oil tanks to explode. Overseers occasionally play the music box when not alerted. This does no damage but negates supernatural abilities when close by. One concept art image appears to show a stiltless tall boy wielding a music box. After the events in Dishonored, the music box were put in storage and not used again until Dishonored the Corroded Man in 1851. When they were removed from storage, many were out of tune. Music boxes with a new design can be seen in Dishonored 2 set in 1852, but are never seen being used by the overseers. A pair of overseers can be heard discussing that their lack of music boxes, saying they're waiting for more to arrive. The overseers are stated to have used the music box against Delia Carperspoon and her coven, but this happened off screen. They failed because the boxes were ineffective against Kieran Jindosh's clockwork soldiers. All right. That'll do it for this episode, I think. Um, I intend to read the animals and the targets next time. Um, I'm having a lot of fun reading this, even if it is making me go a little hoarse. I've been Alfred, and this has been Dishonored Lore, Part 2. Thanks for coming by.